today's keynote speaker is John Dominic Crisson. Don is an Irish American New Testament scholar, historian of early Christianity, and former Catholic priest who has produced both scholarly and popular works. His research is focused on the historical Jesus, on the anthropology of the ancient Mediterranean and New Testament worlds, and on the application of postmodern hermeneutical approaches to the Bible. Dom writes, here then is our present challenge from Jesus' vision of God's kingdom on earth. A sustainable earth requires many difficult decisions, plans, and actions. But above all, a sustainable earth demands a peaceful earth, and a peaceful earth demands a just earth with a fair distribution of all its resources among all its people. For we are in the image and likeness of a nonviolent God whose sun rises alike for all and whose rain descends alike on all. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I give you John Dominic Crisson.
important word in that overture video is matrix. I choose it in order to avoid separable terms like background foreground or <clears throat> context text. Matrix is the background you cannot skip. Like you cannot skip British imperialism for understanding Gandhi. Or the context you cannot avoid. Like you cannot avoid American racism for understanding King. Matrix is what everyone takes for granted. Whether in acceptance or rejected, at any given then and there. Matrix is the common sense knowledge of its own time and place. What then is the necessary matrix for understanding Jesus, either to accept him or even to reject him? About 700 years before Jesus, the Greek poet Hesiod divided human history into five successive periods, the gold, silver, bronze, heroic, and Iron Ages. Later, around 150 years before Jesus, a Roman historian reimagined human history as the five successive empires of Assyria, Media, Persia, Greece, and the Kingdom of Rome itself. Around that same time, a Jewish sage also reimagined human history, but as the succession of Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and the kingdom of God on earth in Daniel chapter 7. For Rome and Israel alike, those contrasting visions of the fifth kingdom were not simply of one more kingdom among many still to come. The kingdom of Rome, or the kingdom of God, was to be the ultimate, the climactic, the last or eschatological rule, eschaton, by the way, is Greek for last, here below upon a transformed earth. That was because each was decreed in heaven and thus divinely ordained. For Virgil's Aeneid, this is the heavenly vision of Rome's God, quoting, For Rome I set no bounds in space or time, but have given empire without end to the Romans, lords of the world, peoples of the toga. It is so decreed, sic placido. But for John's gospel, this is the opposing vision of Israel's God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. When therefore the Romanization of the Jewish homeland began in the 60s before Jesus, the clash was not simply between a very great empire and a very small colony, but it clashed between two fundamentally different visions for the ultimate destiny of the human race. Two profoundly divergent programs for the climax of human evolution two diametrically opposed options for peace on earth. Rome's vision was the contemporary realization of peace through victory, the belief, ever ancient and ever new, that supreme violence would finally establish peace on earth. But whence came that vision? It derived from the normalcy of civilization itself. And Rome would have claimed that its only originality was to conduct victory's peace better than any other emperor had done before it. And that was because Jupiter had decreed it all beforehand. Israel's vision was the contemporary realization of peace through justice. The belief, also ever ancient and ever new, that a fair distribution of all, for all and by all, would, 
and only would establish peace on earth. And whence came that vision? It derived from the normalcy of household experience, in which all members get a fair share, no member starves while others are overfed. And that was because God was the householder of the world house. Furthermore, those opposing visions became personally incarnate programs. First, for Mediterranean Roman imperial theology with Caesar the Augustus, and then for Christian Jewish covenantal theology with Jesus the Messiah. This happens when the titles of Augustus, such as divine, son of God, God incarnate, redeemer from sin, savior of the world, are taken from an emperor and a palatine hill in Rome and given instead to a peasant on the Nazareth Ridge in Galilee. Granted, however, that peace through victory with Caesar the Augustus is established by human violence in collaboration with divine violence, what about peace through justice with Jesus the Messiah? Is it also to be established by human violence in collaboration with divine violence or maybe by human nonviolence in collaboration with divine nonviolence? This question presses because those were both options and should both be emphasized during the Romanization in the Jewish homeland's first common era century. Violent resistance to Romanization, fully documented by the Jewish historian Josephus, occurred in 4 BCE and resulted in 2,000 crucifixions in Jerusalem. It occurred even more fiercely in 64, 66 rather to 74 CE with 500 crucifixions a day in Jerusalem until the Romans ran out of trees. Nonviolent resistance to Romanization, organized and backed if necessary by explicit willingness for martyrdom, is also fully documented by Josephus. These occurred precisely between those two great armed revolts and were directed against local prefect governors, Pilate, Fadus, and Felix, against the Syrian legate governors, Quirinius and Petronius, and even against the emperor Caligula himself. In other words, both violent and nonviolent resistance movements were present from 4 BCE to 66 CE in the Jewish homeland. Both could be equally invoked and defended as collaboration with God's eschatological dream for the world. Those twin options form the matrix of Jewish response to Romanization for John the Baptist and Jesus the Messiah. And I turn now to micromanage their matrix with these guiding questions. First, why did Jesus happen when he happened? Why did Jesus happen where he happened? Second, why did two movements, the baptism movement of John and the kingdom movement of Jesus, arise in the territories of Herod Antipas in the 20s CE, especially after Antipas had ruled without any such opposition for around 25 years. Finally, why is there so much fishy stuff in the gospel text, with Jesus moving from the inland village of Nazareth to the lakeside village of Capernaum, and obtaining so many key companions, like Mary and Peter, James and John, from fishing villages? Romanization of Israel began in earnest with the appointment of Herod the Great and the official title, 
king of the Jews. As Rome's imperial client ruler, he focused primarily on the south by building the great new port city of Sebastus Caesarea for his Roman or overlords and the great new temple plaza for his Jewish subjects. On Herod's death in 4 BCE, and after that immediate armed revolt just mentioned, Augustus refused to make Herod's son Antipas king of the Jews, even though he had traveled to Rome in hopeful expectation of that appointment. Instead, Augustus made Antipas merely a tetrarch, a quarter monarch of Galilee and Perea, two regions in the north not even connected to one another on either side of the Jordan River. Antipas's Roman visit had failed to make him king of the Jews under the first emperor Augustus in 4 BCE. And another later Roman visit would fail again under the third emperor Caligula in 39 CE, who instead made Herod Agrippa I king of the Jews. But what about Antipas under the emperor between Augustus and Caligula? What about Antipas under the second emperor, Tiberius, who became emperor in 14 CE? To improve his monarchic chances or hopes, Antipas had to considerably increase his tax base without thereby pushing his subsistence level peasant into armed revolt. His solution was to relocate his capital city from inland Sepphoris to lakeside Tiberius in order to commercialize the Sea of Galilee as the now appropriately renamed Sea of Tiberius in John 6.1. For John and Jesus, Israel's ancient dream of God's kingdom on earth took on immediately a local habitation and a name on the northwest quadrant of the Sea of Tiberias in the 20s. Antipas's new capital meant a monopoly on fishing with catch to be dry, salted or sauced garum for export as part of Rome's first century Mediterranean globalization. But as the psalm says, if the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, whose is the lake and all of its fishes? Earthquakes occur on the tectonic tensions of fault lines. But while that gives us place, multiple other variables determine the time. Thus it was with the eschatological earthquake by Galilee's lakeside under the strain of Antip Antipas's commercialization. And that earthquake had two stages, first with John the Baptist and then with Jesus the Messiah. Although Jesus had been a disciple of John, even those who derided them both knew to deride them for opposing reasons. They said John was one who fasted and was therefore insane. But Jesus was one who feasted and was there for a glutton, Matthew and Luke. But leaving aside insanity and gluttony, one fasts in preparation for what is future, one feasts in celebration for what is present. Jesus proclaimed the imminent arrival of God's earthly kingdom as a, as a reenacted renewal of the return from Babylonian exile across the Jordan. They must pass once again through the Jordan from east to west, and as its waters baptize their bodies and repentance cleanse their souls, they would become a purified people, and God would finally act in transcendental intervention. It was a profoundly persuasive message of eschatological imminence. But what came was not God's kingdom, but Antipas's cavalry. John died. God did nothing. Jesus watched 
and Jesus changed his vision of both the kingdom of God and the God of kingdom. Jesus could have lifted up the fallen banner of the Baptist and declared that the kingdom was arrived, but was still imminent, still soon, but just a little longer. Instead, Jesus proclaimed not the future arrival, but the present reality of the kingdom. He said, in fact, the kingdom of God is among you in Luke. He said, even though it is still small as a mustard seed, it is already here in Mark. How is that claim possible with Antipas still ruling Galilee and Tiberius still ruling Rome? Where are the swords become plowshares and the spears become pruning hooks promised by Isaiah and Micah? You await, says Jesus, a divine intervention from God alone. God, however, awaits and always has your covenantal participation in entering into, taking upon you, and establishing God's kingdom on earth. Or, as Archbishop Tutu put it, we without God cannot, God without us will not. God's earthly kingdom is not a totally divine intervention, but a divine and human collaboration. Now, granted all this macro and micro matrix, how do we know for sure that first John the Baptist and then Jesus the Messiah were proclaiming a programmatically nonviolent kingdom of God on earth, announcing our nonviolent collaboration with a nonviolent God? We know that their programs were nonviolent because of how both their lives ended. For at least in these two cases, imperial, imperial authority judged correctly. John was not lynched by the banks of the Jordan, nor Jesus by the olive trees in Gethsemane. Each was arrested, imprisoned, then officially <coughs> and legally executed. John in Antipas's Machaerus fortress and Jesus in Pilate's Jerusalem. Pilate is, in fact, the strongest witness we have to the explicitly nonviolent program of Jesus' kingdom movement. Confronted with violent resistance, Roman rulers crucify the leader and his closest supporters all together. Quoting from Mark, for example, a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. Confronted, however, with nonviolent resistance, Roman law decreed that, I'm quoting, the authors of sedition and tumult, or those who stir up the people, shall, according to their rank, either be crucified, thrown to wild beasts, or deported to an island. Close quotation. Both Josephus and Tacitus, and the Apostles' Creed, of course, all agree that Pilate crucified Jesus, but neither arrested nor executed his closest companions. Pilate's judgment was precisely correct from his point of view. In the parabolic conversation between Pilate and Jesus, contrasting Rome's kingdom and God's kingdom in John's gospel, Jesus's companions will never use violence, not even to save Jesus from crucifixion, John 18, 36. Here then is our present challenge from Jesus's vision of God's kingdom on earth. A sustainable earth requires many difficult decisions, plans, and actions. But above all else, a sustainable earth demands a peaceful earth. And a peaceful earth demands a just earth 
with a fair distribution of all its resources among all its peoples. For we are in the image and likeness of a non-violent God, as it shows in Genesis, first chapter, verses 26 to 27, whose sun arises alike for all and whose rain descends alike on all, as Jesus says in Matthew 5, 45. 